Good morning. It is Sunday, March 3rd, 2024, and I'm Pastor Mark Dilley of West Valley Grace Fellowship. I pray that the message this morning will be used to strengthen you in your faith and encourage you in your walk with our Savior and Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I'd like to read first a passage from Scripture, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, begin with verse 16. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Let's pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we bow before you this morning with grateful hearts. Hearts that are filled with such gratitude for the marvelous gospel of your grace and what it declares for us that your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, would die for us. That's how you demonstrated your great love for us in giving your son as the sacrifice for our sins. And he, the Lord Jesus Christ, loved us to that depth that he was willing to endure the suffering and the shame heaped upon him by ungrateful elements of his creation that he was willing to endure all of that so that we might have eternal life and suffer the humiliating death the death of a cross and so teach us today Heavenly Father give us a deeper insight and appreciation into the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. I was just mentioning earlier to some people here about how astounded, amazed I still am when I think about the creator of all that's ever been created, the Lord Jesus Christ, taking on human flesh. The Bible says he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. He was willing to, first of all, take on human flesh so that he might redeem, first, his chosen people, Israel. And when he did that, when he suffered and died on that cross, there was no record, there was no declaration that God was one day going to use that sacrifice to redeem the Gentiles whom he had given over to themselves 2,000 years previously. And for 2,000 years, he never dealt with the Gentiles with only a couple of minor exceptions. Like he sent Jonah to Nineveh. But there's no evidence in the scriptures that Nineveh was redeemed. He sent messengers there, he sent Jonah there to tell them, you guys either shape up or I'm going to destroy you. Well, they shaped up. They believed that message and they shaped up. But whether they were redeemed spiritually, I have no awareness of that at all. But there were different times when he also used Gentiles, Gentile kings and Gentile nations to punish Israel and various things like that. But for the most part, for 2,000 years, he dealt with his chosen people, Israel, and Christ came here and suffered so that the glories of Israel could follow. 
this marvelous new covenant that God had declared and promised and was preparing Israel for. <coughs> That's what he came to do. And now, today, we, as members of the church, the body of Christ, it's my opinion and observation that the practice of communion has become so commonplace and so familiar with people that they really have never examined or thought about it. They went to churches where they had communion every Sunday, they had communion on other special days and everything like that, and so it became very commonplace. And it is nothing common. There is a communion, but it's not common. It's a communion between those who have faith in Jesus Christ and their Savior. And when we take communion, the Apostle Paul tells us, when we participate in that, we do show the Lord's death until he comes. Until he comes for us, to take us to be with him forever. As we participate in that event today, we're demonstrating that we understand the sufferings of Christ on our behalf. And so it, it is a solemn and a sacred activity. It is not an ordinance. It's not the law. You'll hear a lot of people say, there are, oh, God had the law with Israel, but now there are only two ordinances that remain. We have commands, but not ordinances. Ordinances deal with the law. And so there are no ordinances for the church today. But there are commands given in Paul's letters. And so one of the things Paul talks about, and we'll read it later, is what he received from the Lord Jesus Christ concerning this, and I encourage you to read the whole passage sometime, is all about the body and blood of Christ. It's also talking a little bit about the spiritual body of Christ of which we are members. But I'd like to address today what the bread and the cup or the wine or for us the juice represent. And so the bread of communion represents the physical body of Christ. When one of the elect comes to saving faith, trusting that the Lord Jesus Christ died for his or her sins, that person is baptized into the spiritual body of Christ and becomes intimately identified with all that Christ accomplished on the cross. We as members of the church, the body of Christ, have really no investment in the earthly life of Christ. If you search Paul's epistles, you won't find but a few references to the life of Christ, and most of those talk about his suffering and his death on the cross. He, said, he goes so far as to say, I know no man after the flesh, Although I did know Christ that way once, I know him that way no longer. He knows the resurrected, ascended Lord Jesus Christ. And that Christ, who is the same Christ, the office of that Christ today is not Messiah, is not King, even though he is all of that. His office today is the head of the church, which is his body. And so we today make up the spiritual body of Christ. And so let's look at some passages here talking about the literal, physical body of Christ. In Romans 7, 4. So my brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ. <clears throat> That's not referring to the mystical body. It's referring to the fact that the very person, the physical person of Christ, 
and his body was sacrificed on that cross. And so you died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. And so in many of Paul's passages, he talks about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ and how it is to impact the members of the body of Christ. And so uh, people that don't see right division, according to the revelation given to Paul, misapply a lot of things to us today that don't belong there. And this may be a little distracting, but one of them is water baptism. That's the other ordinance that they bring in to the church today. There is no need whatsoever for a Gentile to ever be water baptized today. The Apostle Paul's message tells us there's one baptism, one faith, one hope. And he goes on to say that therefore we have all been baptized. And so I've been baptized even when I didn't know it. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ today, I would guess that none of you knew you got baptized the instant you believed. But you did. The Spirit of God baptized you into the body of Christ instantly. And you took on a whole new life existence. As far as God is concerned, you died to this whole world. It's important that you understand that. Because as long as you're going to love the things of this world, you're going to miss a lot of the riches of God's grace in your life. I've just become really sensitized lately to the fact that maybe not all of you, but I am really shackled at times by time. I don't have time to do this. I don't have time to do that. I don't have time to go visit somebody because I got to do something that I'm more interested in. That's what it really basically amounts to most of the time is that I've got my preferences and I can't have my time being spent on other areas. I uh, Melinda and I and our family rented from a, a man. He's a a good man as far as the world's concerned and everything, but he once told me he doesn't waste his time. He, he was a very successful orthodontist, and he said, I spend all my time doing what will help me and my family. And if there's peripheral things, if they don't fit into that basic scheme, I don't waste my time. Well, I think he actually missed maybe a lot of opportunities to use his time in different fashions that would have been enjoyable. He was a good father to his children. He provided for them very well and everything. But I've come to realize that each one of us is very protective of our time. If you just examine your own life, one of the things that they, we did an exercise in Bible college once where they said, uh, I'd like you to write down five things that are priorities in your life. I can't remember exactly what I wrote down that day, but I'm sure, what was number one, do you think? God. God. That's pretty simple, right? That would be expected of everybody. Then second, family. Then maybe third, I would pick out maybe my vocation or something I really enjoyed. For me, prior to being saved, it was sports. Sports was my God. I spent umpteen hours every day in sports. Do you ever, ever see anybody doing much of that today? Like on Sunday afternoon from 10 or from 10 o'clock in the morning till 8 o'clock at night? Anyway, we listed our priorities. And then they said, okay, now you've got those priorities on paper. How much time do you spend in each one of those activities? How much time do you dedicate to God? How much time do you dedicate to your family? And all of a sudden you start to realize that the things that I mentally know should be priorities, 
aren't the priorities in my self-centered heart. And that's what Christ came to do, to change all of that for us. The other thing I found out, and this one, none of you will suffer with it, but it's control. Control of your life. Making the decisions that you want to make. Making sure that anyone that comes into your environment fits into your control. And now we'd all deny we do that, but we continually do that. That's our nature, is to try to control different areas of our everyday life. Now, it doesn't mean we just throw it all to the wind. We have rational thoughts and priorities and everything else. But the real issue is, I don't have to control any of you. It used to be that was thought that good preaching was always talking about smoking and drinking and chewing and all of that stuff and getting people not to do it. If you preach grace, they'll go wild on you. If you tell people you're free to do whatever you want. Most people are doing pretty much what they want right now. They've made choices and they make those decisions and they control all of that. And again, it's important that we do maintain some control in our life. But I believe that from the moment you were saved, the moment you were baptized by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ, you no longer had any ownership of your own life in reality. You were bought with a price. Therefore, you are to glorify God with your spirit and your body, which are his. When you got saved, God bought you and he owned you. And when you grow, you come to a place in your life where you agree wholeheartedly with that. And then the struggles start to come. But Christ gave his body. He sacrificed control. He gave up his omnipresent position and became confined, confined to a human body, which was a tremendous sacrifice in itself. But then when he died on that cross and gave his life, here's what Paul says in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. That's a fact for every believer in Jesus Christ. The problem is, most of those believers don't know this, and they don't understand it. And then he goes on to say, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Now, much like that priorities in life question, how many of you recognize that Christ is living his life in you? It's no longer your life. You still live in the flesh. But the life that you have today is from Christ and his heavenly father. And Christ is living in you. As far as God is concerned, you're dead. You're dead to all of that old thing. That's what I believe uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 is saying when it says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Mm -hmm. He is, isn't in the scriptures. It's not in the original writings. What it really says is if any man be in Christ, or actually if any in Christ, it is or it, new creation. It's not talking about us being a new creation in that passage. It's talking about God is making a new creation called the body of Christ. And in that new creation, all things have passed away. It's talking about all that you were in Adam. God doesn't see that anymore. That's dead. It's done away with. We don't believe it, but it's a fact. That's why we've been raised up to walk in newness of life because old things have all passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We have a new life, a new existence in the one who died for us. And so that's why this communion experience 
the bread and the wine, or in our case, the crackers and the juice, are representative of the body and blood that provided all of this for us. And so let's look at 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 16. And we just read that in our opening. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we have actually been had a participation in the sacrifice of Christ. And so it's a participation in the blood of Christ and is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ. We have literally been participating through Christ in all that he accomplished for us. And then Colossians 1, 21 through 23. Again, it's my opinion that every saved person needs to come to a place in their understanding and their realization that before they were saved, and your first reaction would be, no, no, not me. But before we were saved, we were enemies of God. Most people, I've heard many people say, oh, I've always been close to God. That's just not scriptural. It's a nice thought. It would really be nice if it's true. But the truth of the matter is, every one of us was dead in trespasses and sin. Every one of us was an enemy of God in our minds. Even though we might have had some religious training and everything else that modified our behaviors and sort of salved our consciences and made us feel a little better about our walk with God in some way. But when you are saved and redeemed by the Spirit of God and he starts to illumine your hearts to the truth, and as you grow in grace, you look back at your previous existence and be sickened by it you will start to be able to honestly, but without fear, own it. And say, I did all of that for myself. I did all that for my glory. I was doing all these things, and we may not even understand or really believe that. But as we grow in grace, we'll come to find out that the one who shed his blood and sacrificed his body did it all to deliver us from ourselves and the sin that so easily besieged us. And so here in, Col in uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, it says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. That's the same thing that Ephesians 2, 1 and 3 says when it says that uh, he, we were dead. Remember in times past, or however it says it, you were dead in trespasses and sins. You walked according to the course of this world. You were a child of disobedience. It just goes through all of those things. But now, here in this passage, it says, but now he has reconciled you. And that's sort of like a bookkeeping term. He's changed the print, so to speak. You remember in the old days before computers and all this good technology, you got your bank statement and then you went back to your little checkbook and you checked them all out and, uh oh, the bank got two of my dollars. They got, they got some money or they shouldn't have and then you have to go back and look at it more closely and then you can reconcile so that your own statement lines up with the bank statement. And I'm sure they periodically make a mistake. But I found in my life, most of the time, I was the one that had to do the reconciling. I'm the one that had to change my figures. And that's true with this doctrine called reconciliation. God never has to reconcile himself. He, is, he doesn't make mistakes. So we were the ones that were reconciled to God. God doesn't get reconciled. And so it says here, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death. Why? To present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. 
And then there is a little bit of a stipulation, but it's not at all uh, relating to your salvation. It's about this being free in, and without blemish from accusation in your life. And that is, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out for you and held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, have become a servant. And there's so much in this marvelous gospel of grace that God has made known to us that it's hard to limit myself to the topic. Uh, like today, the body and blood of Christ. There's so much that I don't know if you know. And so when you hear the word Paul, there should be just uh, like a definition. If I, if I say something sweet, everybody has an image. If I'm talking about food, everybody pretty much can almost taste sweet. They can identify it in their thinking automatically. When I, when I hear the word Paul in relationship to the Apostle Paul, there's just a whole bunch of definitions that come right away. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul is the one that was chosen by Christ to reveal a body of truth called the mystery. I mean, they're just, the more you build up your definitions of these terms, the richer and deeper your faith will be day by day. And that's why I can't emphasize enough to study. I'm going to give you some homework at the end of this chapter. I, I, I'm not the grade or anything else. I just encourage you and give you some direction where you might go and read some things that should help you in your faith. But let's quickly go on here. First Peter, again, talks about the Messiah and Peter's understanding of this. When Peter and the apostles, when Jesus Christ was crucified, they saw nothing good in that whatsoever. There just was no good in what they did to Christ for Peter. But now Peter is seeing some new things, and I think it has come, first of all, from the revelation of the Spirit of God in his life, but also from the revelation of the grace of God that was given to Paul. So Peter says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness, by his wounds you have been healed. Now we have to be careful that we don't take that by his wounds you are healed and take it back to one of the promises in the Old Testament. By his stripes we are healed and it talks about different things in the Old Testament. Those are promises to Israel. We today have no claim to the healing of the cross in the physical realm. The Israelites had that claim, and they had the gift of healing. They could heal people. When the Lord Jesus Christ walked in this earth, he healed probably hundreds, if not thousands of people completely and permanently as long as they lived. The one thing that couldn't be healed is death. Death is going to be cast into the lake of fire way out in the back end of that timeline. But Today, in the church, the body of Christ, and the revelation given to Paul, there is no healing promises physically. In fact, even though Paul did have that gift early on, later on, he's going to leave Trophimus in Miletus sick. Well, if he could have healed him, that would have been a lot simpler. And he also gives Timothy some instruction. He tells Timothy, drink a little wine. For thine often infirmities. And so the concept that people get sick today because of sin. Well, the basically root cause of all sickness is sin. But it's not yours. It's Adam's. Now, your sin can contribute to sickness. I mean, if you're a two-pack smoker, there's a good chance that you're going to end up with cancer. And the Bible teaches, even in grace, Paul says, Do not be deceived, for God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. And so that doesn't mean, well, that's quite a finger point back at me, but that doesn't mean we should just eat whatever we want, whenever we want, or treat our bodies in any such fashion, because 
like Christ's body, our bodies today are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's living in us. And we're instructed to take care of those temples. Uh, because of time, I'm going to skip a few of these uh, and go on to the second point and uh, finish up. The juice of communion represents the blood that Christ shed on the cross. This was one of my most favorite verses when I was first saved. It still is one of my most favorite verses, but I now understand it in its proper context. 1 Peter 1 18 and 19. He writes, For you know, now he's talking to Jewish people, but we can make application from what we know from Paul's and Paul's declaration. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. Now again, what he's talking about is the religion of the Jews under the Old Covenant. Nobody was ever saved by keeping the Old Covenant. They were saved by faith in God, believing what he had told them. And so it goes on here that uh, he says, uh, 19, Verse 19, you were, not re, uh, you were not redeemed from the empty ways of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. There is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. It's a sad thing that human beings have concluded that we've got to get this ugly stuff out of the gospel. We've got to get this crucifixion. We've got to get the blood of Christ, the passion of Christ, all of that ugly stuff. That doesn't make anybody feel good. Well, I rejoice in that today. Not that it happened, but that was the means by which God was going to restore us to him. And so, communion is a representation of all of that. And it's a serious thing. But today, with that all removed, people are taking communion and even being told once in a while that when you take this communion, you get your sins forgiven. Or when you take this communion, you are restored in some fashion. The elements of communion have no mystical or spiritual power whatsoever. I also personally don't believe that the elements are changed at some point into the actual body and blood of Christ. And so uh, that's what I was taught early on, that when we took communion, we actually participated in the body and blood of the very person of Christ. And I don't believe that. I believe it's a spiritual interaction. But the elements themselves have no power whatsoever. The power is in the Spirit of God who lives in you and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so going on here in Romans 5, 9, it says, Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath? Through him. For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through life? Paul never talks about the cross or about the death of Christ or anything without relating it in some fashion to how that impacts us. <coughs> That's the gospel of salvation. And what a shame it is when <coughs> different organizations have communion on such a regular basis that it's almost like a, just a common thing. There's no real sensitivity to what's going on when we do this. 
And so in the Lord Jesus Christ, he has made it possible now that our citizenship is in heaven for us. And one day we're going to have a body, a body just like his glorious body. Every member of the church, the body of Christ, is going to be changed. And some transformed instantly, in just like that, they all will be. But that's what 1 Thessalonians is talking about. The dead in Christ shall rise first. That word rise means stand erect. Every dead member, every, every member of the body of Christ who died physically and had gone to be with Christ are going to come back with him in the clouds and instantly they're going to be given a new body from heaven. And then those who are alive and remain will be instantly changed. I don't know whether it's on the way up or when they get there or when it happens, but every member, we all will be changed into a body fashioned after his glorious body for all eternity. And it's a, a body that is celestial. It can survive any place in the universe. I don't believe the kingdom saints are going to have that kind of body. I believe kingdom saints will have earthly bodies. They won't be able to say, hey, I think I'll run over to heaven for a couple of days. They will be earthbound in their eternity. But we as members of the church, the body of Christ, will be able to transverse the universe, I believe. And so, moving on down just a little further here, turn the page, and uh, Paul talks so much about how our redemption is in the blood of Christ. When you hold that representative cup in your hands and look at it, that's representing the eternal, infinite blood of Christ that was shed for us. That he was willing to do all of that for us. If you have never trusted Christ, if you if you're not saved because you asked Jesus into your heart, you're not saved because you made some commitment to God in any fashion, you're not saved because you've been a nice person or anything like that whatsoever. You are saved. Because the Spirit of God illumined your heart to the truth of the gospel and you believed it. And that belief means more than just knowing it and accepting it to be true. It means you have trusted it. That you put all of your weight on Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is everything. And everything else doesn't really matter. And so you have no claim to your salvation other than the fact that the merits of Christ could provide it. And you believe that and trust in it, you're saved. And so the elements of communion have no mystical or spiritual power. They do not do anything to the communicant. They have nothing other than representatives of the body and blood. What continues to astound me is the depth of the love of Christ. And we've already talked about that. As the creator of everything that is and ever shall be, everything that's ever been created, he humbled himself. He limited himself and took on human flesh to die for us. He did all of that and I was blind to the gospel of his grace, living in trespasses and sins, and he still died for me. And God the Father then made me alive with Christ and raised me up to walk in newness of life. And so 2 Corinthians 13, 5 tells us, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith Test yourselves. I've had uh, different people talk to me once in a while about some of the things I say, and they say, well, you're going to damage people's faith. You're going to make them start to doubt. I have no power like that, really. If you're not confident, if you don't have the full assurance of your faith, that's between you and God. 
But if you are saved, you should have the witness of the Spirit of God. It talks about, he bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. I know it. I have no doubt whatsoever, even though I'm a, a reprobate, I can't even think of the nastiest descriptions. I could use some of them, but they're probably too vulgar here. But I know that I deserve nothing from God but judgment. And yet I know the gospel of his grace. I know the sacrifice of his son on my behalf. And I've trusted in him. And if that's not good enough, there's nothing left. There's no hope. There is nothing else left. And so I pray that each one of you can be here today with the full assurance of your salvation, that nothing in all the world can ever separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And so it says here, are you trusting in the sacrifice of Christ alone? Do you have the full assurance that he who knew no sin was made sin for you, that he bore your sins in his body on that cross? Are you convinced that Christ died in your place and that God has forgiven you all your trespasses? Not just the old ones, but the ones you haven't committed yet today. The ones you haven't committed yet tomorrow, you will be sieged with sin your entire life. But God is greater. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Now, a saved person, I want to be careful here, I would hope a saved person would not say, oh, he's giving me license to go out and sin because they're all paid for. I'm not suggesting that for a second. It, my sin repulses me most of the time. Some of the time, I'm, it's hidden from me a little bit. But most of the time, it makes me sick to see who I am apart from Christ. And so let's look at uh, this opportunity as uh, men come forward to uh, take some time to look and examine ourselves and our faith in Christ.